Okay, so we are, yeah, we are live right now. Uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome all of you, the participants in the Zoom, as well as the ones that who are watching from the home on the Facebook Live. So I am Pramesh Fresta. On behalf of all new organization USC chapter, I would like to welcome everybody and eHeritage. This is our own program that we have created the platform where we will be discussing more about the heritage side, whether it is a tangible or intangible. And we have our own Prozor Gurzu who has been instrumental, yes, on this, uh, in this program. And he is the division director for the heritage division for our organization, Old Neva organization, USA chapter. So I'm very glad to have today, Dr. Manik Vajrasarya, and uh, he's really well known what he has been doing. So he has, he has the PhD on this. So I will just give you the third bio of him. So originally, yes, uh, he is from Lalitpur, Nepal. And, but nowadays, right, he is residing in Germany with his family. Uh, so he has the PhD from Aichi Gaikuen University in Nagoya, Japan. And uh, he has been uh, working in Heidelberg University in Germany since 2011. And uh, during 2012 to 2015, he has worked on the edition and translation of the Nepalika Bhupa Bamsavali. This Bamsavali was published in 2015. It will be the main topic of today's talk. So today's talk, he, he will be based on this, his uh, work. And since 2015, he has been working on the project Documenta Nepalica, which is creating a large metadata repository of Nepalese document and making digital editions and publication of selected documents. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Manik Vazracharya. Thank you very much. Namaste, everyone. Jojo Lappa. Uh, let me share my screen. Can I? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you World Newa Organization USA. Uh, and thank you to uh, Prameshji and my guru Prozol Ratnavajracharya for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my talk today is entitled On the 19th Century Chronicle of Nepal, but uh, I will go um, a bit beyond this, or I would like to start with uh, uh, the very uh, introduction to Nepalese Bamshavali first, you know, because I think some of the audiences we have, some of the friends we have here, probably are not so um, uh, uh, not so acquainted with uh, uh, this form of uh, history writing from Nepal. Um, so uh, this is an overview of how the talk, my talk will go today. I will give a short introduction to traditional historical writings in Nepal, uh, its characteristics, um, uh, some discussion on typology, and um, I will introduce you some selected published and unpublished uh, Nepalese chronicles. And uh, depending on how much time remains, uh, I go a bit more into the introduction of the, the, the book that uh, I wrote with uh, Professor Axel Michaels uh, in 2015 uh, on, on one of the Bamshavalis of 19th century. Um, so before we go further, I want to clarify a thing here that uh, I use the term traditional history writing or historical writing um, to mention that it is the pre-modern historical texts from Nepal uh, and it excludes the modern uh, historiography. Um, and I should uh, say that uh, of all the countries in South Asia, Nepal probably has one of the biggest corpus of um, traditional historical writings. 
or a chronicle preserved. These writings are generally known as Vamshavalis. Although I'll show you later that uh, there are very, uh, various types of traditional history writings in Nepal, and not all of them are uh, called Vamshavalis. However, for the simplicity, let us use the term Vamshavali or, or chronicle to denote generic name uh, as a generic name for the traditional history writings. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, the corpus of Nepalese chronicles, the Nepal German Manuscript Preservation Project, uh, I guess um, most of you might have heard of this. Um, there was a, a joint project between Nepalese government and uh, German government uh, starting from 1970s uh, for 30 years uh, for the preservation of uh, manuscripts uh, and epigraphic um, uh, documents mostly. Uh, 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 and it, it did a lot of microfilming, about 200,000 uh, manuscripts were microfilmed. And if uh, there is a, a category, catalog for this um, project available, and at least um, in my preliminary research, at least at least 110 Bamshavalis, Bamshavali manuscripts. And um, there is one archive, private archive called Asha Safukuti in Kathmandu. Uh, I made a quick search and I found at least 15 um, chronicles there. And um, at the Hudson Collection in the British Library, which is also called India Office Library, um, this section where Hudson Collection is housed, it has uh, 65 titles under chronicles. So if we add to this um, Bamshavalis that are in collection of private individuals, monasteries, gutis um, in Nepal, and, um, and uh, if we also include the university libraries and you know, the texts in the university libraries around the world, the, this might num number another hundred. So the corpus is really big for, for this genre of historiographical text. And uh, I would like to mention uh, one name here, Yogesh Raz, Yogesh Raz Mishra. Um, he wrote an article called Towards a Cache Typology of Historiography, Reading Historical Texts from South Asia. I find this, I mentioned this article because um, uh, I find his argument um, in this uh, quite, in, quite remarkable. Uh, he just discusses in this um, article uh, the classification of historical narratives. Um, proposed by uh, one German historian called Jörn Rusin and uh, another American historian, uh, Hayden White. Uh, he criticizes that both the typologies described by uh, these authors belong to uh, narrow Anglo-European tradition. And uh, then he goes on to describe uh, South Asian historical texts, uh, including Bamshabalis, Charter text, which we will discuss later on, um, which also includes uh, um, Katanabalis, and we will, of course, discuss all these terms later on. What is interesting is he argues that the texts, these kind of Nepalese historiographical texts, should be considered as histories, not just as the sources of history what many of the historians so far have, have um, been telling. Um, because there is a, um, especially this Europe, Eurocentric uh, idea, which is still there, is that uh, countries like Nepal, India, and China didn't create historiography. There is no, um, no proper history writing in these countries, and uh, and this argument, uh, even though it is old, uh, is still there. Uh, but of course, there are many uh, scholars who deny it, uh, who recognize the uh, the value of historical writing in Nepal. So um, I also take the stand to this argument, 
and suggests that the traditional historical texts in Nepal should be treated as a distinct form of historiography, not just as the sources of history, and their scientific value must be recognized. Um, let me go on. Let's start with uh, what is a Vamshavali? Uh, what is a chronicle? Um, I mean, it's a general, general uh, introduction also, uh, not just for Nepalese Vamshavali. Yeah? Uh, the word Vamshavali is a Sanskrit term. Uh, it literally means genealogy. And, gene and whose genealogy? Mostly these are the genealogy of kings, or it can be in several cases, genealogy of a clan or some families. Also, Bamshavalis are a narration of historical and legendary events. Mm -hmm. And um, in the case of Nepalese Bamshavalis, what we find uh, more prominently are the um, events of donations, patronage to the monuments, uh, also description of rituals and um, important festivals also. Also, Bamshabalis are also uh, the story of origin of places and are also monuments. For example, Swayambhu Purana, which is uh, a story of the origin of the Kathmandu Valley itself. Um, Bamshavalis are also uh, reports of deeds of kings, deities, sages, sadhus, monks, bhikshus, bodhisattvas, and um, some heroes. Uh, let us go into... Um, some characteristics of uh, Nepalese Bamshavali writings. Um, I have to mention the word itihasa here, which literally means itihasa, so indeed it was, it happened so. Yeah. So what it means is the Bamshavalis are mostly a retelling and they are not the first at hand experience. Mm -hmm. So this is against the emphasis of dominance of first hand experiential truth in a Western historio historiography, so to say. Um, so retelling is emphasized. And um, a Bamshavali, especially the bigger ones, the comprehensive ones, are compiled from various sources. The, the family of compilers of Bamshavali, they have, they generally compile bits and pieces of different sources of genealogies to create a bigger comprehensive volume of Bamshavalis. Uh, so in a way we can say that chronicles are generally combining of several genealogical lists. So we can, when we read a Bamshavali, um, some Bamshavalis, we can um, recognize the, the changing of styles uh, within the text. So that gives us the idea that uh, they have been compiled from different sources. Um, in a Bamshavali, in most cases, the writers are not known the scribes are, the authors are generally not known. Um, and the, even though we, uh, even though the Bamshavali itself may not have scribes or authors uh, written, but we know, we generally know who write, uh, writes them. Yeah? Um, so generally they are the Buddhist and Hindu priests mostly Newars, such as Rajapadhyas, Vajravacharyas, Karmacharyas, Joshis, or they can be merchants also. Sometimes we have um, Bamshavalis written by merchant families, 
or Vaidyas, or it could be, it can be from different classes. Uh, any class of people uh, can uh, uh, write genealogies. And uh, the other peculiarity of Bamshabalis are that uh, the narrators are omnipresent. That means uh, that uh, the narrators are involved. They put uh, their point of view. For example, they describe a dream of a king. Yeah? And sometimes they put uh, their opinion also. And um, what is interesting in Bamshabalis is there is absence of skepticism or doubt. There are many events uh, that might be mythological or uh, historically uh, doubtful, but uh, the narrator himself uh, never puts skepticism into what is being written. And uh, the Vamshabali uh, narratives are also plots. That means they are focused on particular landscape. For example, most of the Nepalese Bamshabalis are focused in Kathmandu Valley, or it can be also focused on certain temple or certain deity also. So the, what I mean to say is that generally the Bamshabalis have uh, regional scopes or very limited, limited scope. So for that matter, an Bamshabali can be also called an indigenous form of history. Uh, or an indigenous form of uh, historiography. Um, another interesting thing is that um, the Nepalese Bamshavali please um, uh, have a cyclical concept of time. I'm sure uh, all of you know this. You know the the time is divided into four uh, yugas, and um, most of these comprehensive Bamshabalis, they uh, begin with uh, the, the Satya Yuga and the first uh, of these four Yugas and generally proceed to the current Yuga uh, called Kali. Um, and also what is interesting is that in Bamshabalis, we see that um, uh, in, in the uh, narratives of the, the, in the earliest narratives, the agency of human and agency of uh, divine are closed. And as the time passes, the, the, the closeness of human agency and divine agency become farther and farther. Um, yes, and, um, and the last um, specialty I want to mention is that uh, the Nepalese Bansabalis are uh, not uh, um, not meant to be strictly historiographical texts, you know, because their message, uh, in most cases, is uh, of the soteriological. So instead of um, um, instead of uh, just uh, being a mundane text, Bansabalis try to uh, fill themselves with uh, divine agency and uh, teaching of spirituality. So religious motivation is important, emancipation is important, and ethics uh, is important. So these are the characteristics characteristics of uh, Nepali Bhamshavali. I'm sure uh, the Indian Bhamshavali is not very different than this. Mm, if you have any Thing to add on, on to this or suggestion, please, uh, please let me know later. Okay, um, let's go into the brief typology of uh, Nepali Vamshavali. Mm. In this, um, slide here. Uh, I've tried to categorize uh, Nepali Bamshabalis um, um, according to temporal factor, uh, according to the time uh, period when they are pre prepared. So um, 
my dividing line is 19th century. So we have Vamshabalis that are pre 19th century. And we have a plethora of Vamshabalis, also known as uh, Bhasha Vamshabalis, uh, that uh, proliferated in 19th century. Uh, so, um, um, so what are the first kind? Uh, the 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 pre um, 19th century Vamshabalis are also genealogies. Um, and the first one, the first Pamshabali so far in Nepal, which is uh, very well known is Gopalra's Vamshavali, which was compiled in uh, late 14th century uh, during the time of Jayasthiti Malla. Um, and also um, we have uh, before 19th century and I have to also mention that most of the bomb um prepared um, before 19th century are either Newari, uh, Nepal Bhasha, or Sanskrit. You know, I would say uh, and the Nepal Bhasha bomb might be more, uh, but uh, this is uh, still a, a topic of study. Um, the other kind of um, Bamshabalis is are the genealogy of certain clan and families, um, or also pre nineteenth century. And then we have a, a big amount of texts, uh, generally known as Katanavalis, which means um, we, uh, Katanavali literally means um, the garland of events. So they are the reports of events. Uh, collected in families. Uh, and also uh, these uh, Katnavalis can be uh, related to certain deity or certain temple or a certain guti also. Then uh, we have one, uh, one typology, uh, one type of uh, historiographical text called chata. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a newari term, a medieval term. Um, uh, I'm not very sure about the etymology of this term yet. I uh, asked once with uh, Professor Kashinath Tamot about this term, and uh, his idea was uh, it must have come from Chai Yata. So why this happened, why something happened. But it could um, also mean what happened, what kind of events happened. So if um, uh, in the article I mentioned of Yogesh Raj, he puts, uh, he places within the, oh, this, uh, uh, within the typology of Chata, different other, um, other historiographical writings such as Katnavalis, the um, garland of events, Katana Bibarana, um, report of events, Aitihasika Tipota, which means uh, historical notes, um, Dharapo, which means a um, list of um, uh, list of events or diaries. And these charter texts are mostly, um, as I told, written in Sanskrit or Nepal Bhasha. And um, there's a tradition, uh, also Yogesh Raj has mentioned that, uh, it is called Chata Soe or Chai Soe. Apparently, um, these terms are used for, uh, for uh, used when uh, people have to consult to these historiographical texts, consult to these historical texts to know what happened in the past uh, for example, in the case of uh, calamities, uh, when people have to know how it was dealt with in the past, then this process apparently was called chatasoy, chai soy, to see what happened, to look for why it happened, or to look for what happened in the past. But all of these need more study. Um, you see, apart from um, Gopalra's Bamshavali and uh, the 
the Kesher library Bamshavali. Um, there is almost no uh, publication yet uh, from this section of uh, this part of uh, historical text. So most of the charter texts are unknown, even though there are hundreds of them. And then uh, we have uh, another pre 19th century uh, historical text called uh, Puranas or Mahatmyas. Uh, Puranas such as uh, Swayambhu Purana uh, uh, or um, Mahatmyas, they, who are glorification of certain places, uh, the, the spatial glorification text. Yeah. Uh, we have Nepal Mahatmya, for example, and these are in Sanskrit. Um, so coming to 19th century, um, uh, if we look at um, what is available uh, in terms of uh, printed Bamshavalis now, we have uh, Gopala's Bamshavali, which was um, compiled uh, in the late 14th century. Then suddenly we have the Bamshavalis published, um, Bams uh, the published Bamshavalis uh, compiled in 19th century and after only. So there's a dark um, period of uh, research between end of 14th century and 19th century. So for uh, all of you uh, who are interested in, in study of uh, this form of historiography, there is a, it's a hot topic, I would say. So about the 19th century bomb shavalis, um, uh, we have, uh, they are called Vasha bomb uh, We even have um, uh, two volume bomb shavali published by uh, National Library of Nepal. And uh, they are entitled Bhasha bomb shavali, literally. And the reason uh, why it is called Vasha bomb shavali is because they are written in the language of people. Uh, in this case, the, the Nepali people, the Nepali language. Um, and um, one may ask, you know, why uh, there is a sudden proliferation of um, uh, uh, genealogical texts um, in 19th century. Uh, in our research, uh, we have uh, we have found that most of these are uh, these takes are um, there because of uh, because they are commissioned commissioned either by uh, colonial in interest uh, the the British uh, colonial officials were interested in Nepalese past and also. Um, Many of them were uh, commissioned by uh, the palace, which means the, the Shah Palace, uh, the Pithman Shah um, conquered Kathmandu Valley in 1769. So, um, so they needed uh, to, um, to gain uh, a legitimacy for their ruling and, uh, and, and uh, I guess uh, through uh, this kind of genealogical text, Bamshabalis, they could link themselves to the glorious past of, of the valley or of the center. Mm. So uh, that is why you know, there are so many Bamshabalis uh, in the 19th century. Um, and these genealogies are not all, only of shahas. You know, they can they were they are of Rana rulers and other high caste uh, clans. Also, we we find a lot of them. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce you some of the published and then um, unpublished uh, Bamshabalis. Um, I have not chosen them because of certain category. Um, I've just chosen them uh, because I thought they are interesting or important uh, because there are many. Uh, and uh, due to the time constraint, I can't um, introduce you all of this. Uh, 
So the first is um, I told you about already uh, Gopal Raj Bamshavali. Uh, this was edited by uh, Dana Bajra, Bajracharya and translated into English by Kamal Prakash Malla. Uh, in 1985, it was published um, in Wiesbaden, Germany. Uh, but it was published under the umbrella of Nepal Research Center, uh, which is not there anymore in Kathmandu. Um, the original language of this Vamshabali is Sanskrit and uh, the old Nepal Vasa, because the original text is from 14th century. Um, and the manuscript uh, is um, the manuscript which they have edited and translated is uh, currently archived in National Archives Nepal. And it was also microfilmed uh, by this Nepal German Manuscript Preservation Project under the real number B1823. Um, the manuscript itself has 47 folios. Uh, but uh, the early, uh, the first 16 uh, folios are missing. So uh, why this manuscript is called Gopala Raj Bamshavali? Gopala, as you uh, know, is uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, um, uh, rulers um, in Nepal. And uh, when um, Cecil Bendal first found this manuscript in, in Bead Library, uh, or the fragments of uh, this manuscript in Bead Library, uh, he must have named it because it started with uh, the Gopal dynasty. So that's why um, he named this Gopal Rajman Sabali. And also this manuscript is also called as uh, Bendal Bamshavali by some scholars. But if you look into the manuscript itself, Bamshavali itself, it calls itself Bhuta Britanta, which means accounts of the past. Um, this is also um, one of the most uh, widely used um, Vamshabalis of Nepal uh, because it's it's um, translated into English by Daniel Wright, uh, published in 1877 by Cambridge University Place Press. Um, many scholars called it uh, Wright's Chronicle. Actually, Wright didn't translate it; he only introduced it. And uh, this is the very Bamshavali we retranslated in 2015. Uh, not just retranslated, we have also um, uh, we also did the edition of the of the text. Um, so uh, who is this uh, Daniel Wright? Daniel Wright was a surgeon, a doctor at the British residency in Kathmandu from 1866 to 1876. And um, this, um, the manuscript that uh, was used for this translation uh, was from Cambridge University. Currently it is archived as manuscript additional 1952. And um, as the cover of the book says, uh, the, uh, the book was translated, the Bamshavali was translated by uh, certain Munshi Shivashankar, who was the Munshi of, uh, Munshi are the, the professional translators, so to say, uh, uh, a Munshi of the uh, residency in Kathmandu and also Pandit Gunananda, who is a Shakya Pandit from Okubahal, who was a Shakya Pandit from Okubahal. And uh, the original manuscript is in Nepali. So um, this is the Vasha Bamshavali I mentioned you about. And, uh, it was published in Vikram Sambat 2020 and 2023, uh, published as two volumes. The first volume is by uh, Nayanath Paudel, uh, edited by Nayanath Paudel. The second by Devi Prasad Lamsal, 
both are in Nepali language. And these editions are based on um, manuscript number 7380 7, from Nepal Rashtri Pustakale, uh, Nepal National Library. And another man, manuscript number 332 from Bir Pustakale, which, which is also known as uh, Darbar Library. Uh, the third one I've chosen here is by uh, Yogi Norhari Nath. Uh, this is a very late um, Vamshavali. Uh, it was uh, compiled uh, only after the earthquake of 1934. And uh, this is, uh, even though it is called Vamshavali, but it's, um, it's um, in, instead of uh, focused, being focused in, on genealogy, this is a uh, Vamshavali of uh, places. So it's a special Vamshavali, uh, contains narratives of various uh, deities and various sites of the Kathmandu Valley. Th this is also originally in Nepali. And uh, the manuscript for um, this Vamshavali, this edition uh, apparently came from a household from Lagantol in Kathmandu. Um, so the last published um, Vamshavali that I want to introduce uh, was um, translated in the journal uh, SINAS, Center for uh, Nepalese and Asian Studies at Tribhuvan University by Kamal Prakash Malla. Uh, this article actually this is a long article uh, also contains the facsimile of the original manuscript. Uh, the manuscript is now uh, archived, um, also in National Archive uh, currently, under the uh, microfilm number uh, A31910. The original language is in Sanskrit. And uh, this, uh, a fragment of this, uh, this Bamshabali was first found by Luciano Petek in Kesar Library. So that's why he named it Kesar Bamshabali, KV. But um, Kamal Prakash Malla found uh, a complete version of this later on, and, and he published it uh, in this article. So this is also a short but important uh, Bamshabali. Uh, let me introduce you uh, some, uh, quickly introduce you some published bomb shovels. I think the time is running out. Um, uh, oh, uh, sorry, this is also one of the published bomb shovels by uh, Bikram Jit Hasrat. Uh, I chose this because um, uh, this uh, book is uh, based on the original manuscript written in uh, a Bamshavali written by um, uh, Brian Hofton Hodgson in the beginning of 19th century. And uh, the manuscript, um, his draft copy is uh, housed at the uh, India Office Library in the British Library, London. And uh, Hasrat seemed to have literally put the copy um, as the book without uh, talking much about the manuscript itself. So I find this quite interesting and I will show you the facsimile of the, the original, uh, uh, the, the handwriting of Hodgson uh, later. Uh, let's look at some of the unpublished Bamshabalis. Um, the first one I choose is, I think, uh, one of the most important um, newer Bamshavalis. Uh, newer, I mean, by newer, I mean uh, the 19th century Bamshavali. This is one of the earliest 19th century Bamshavali written in Nepali. Um, the Bamshavali itself. Uh, calls itself uh, Raja Upakhyana. That means uh, stories uh, of the kings. Uh, it is archived at the Silvan Levy collection 
at the institute uh, institutes the orient the college de france français college de france i'm sorry for my pronunciation um under the manuscript number scl8 b7 uh it has 85 folios uh and nine lines per page it is dated it has a colophon uh the writer is known it is dated to 1834 ce 1891 bikram era um, and the writer of the manuscript is someone called siddhi narayan duijavara uh, which means a brahmin a newar brahmin uh, from pashupati area devapattana and the colophon says that um, Siddhi Narayana prepared this Vamsavali for uh, Munshi Lakshmi Dasa, who we know him. Uh, he's a, he was the Mir Munshi, the main Munshi of the Nepalese palace. And he was a very powerful person and uh, was in office for 55 decades, 50 years starting from uh, Bhimsen Thapa's period until uh, Jangabadur's uh, period. So that means it was a commission from the palace and the manuscript was handed over to Lakshmi Das Pradhan. And uh, we know some history of this manuscript uh, that this manuscript um, went to the Rana Palace and uh, Silvan Levy was presented with this manuscript later on by Dev Samser Rana. So that's why, uh, that's how it came into uh, Silvan Levy collection in Paris now. And um, Levy's book, Lo Nepal, and the three volume book of uh, Silvan Levy, Lo Nepal, uh, is largely based on this manuscript. But, um, the manuscript it, itself has never been um, uh, editioned, uh, edited. There is no edition available yet, and there is no uh, translation available yet. You know, so this would be um, a very important manuscript to uh, to work uh, if someone is interested. Um, the second manuscript I found uh, was we found uh, is from. Um, from uh, the Hudson archive again, uh, from the Hudson collection at the British Library, um, uh, archived under under volume fifty two in the archive. Uh, it has uh, fifty two folios, but uh, the first six folios are missing. And the last incident reported, it doesn't have a colophon, so we don't know uh, when it was uh, actually composed. Um, but um, we know uh, from the last incident reported, uh, which is an earthquake of 1833. So we can presume that uh, the manuscript was finished in 1833 mm -hmm. uh, during the time of King Rajendra. Uh, it is in Nepali language and the, the manuscript is, uh, is written in different kinds of paper. And so sometimes some pages have 22 lines per page, and others have up to 55 lines. And uh, our assumption is uh, that this um, manuscript was compiled in Patan uh, in the family of Pandit Amritananda Shakya, Amritananda Bandya uh, at Okubaha. So uh, this one I wanted to show you as an example of uh, how the medieval Katanabalis uh, looked light and like. Uh, this manuscript is uh, in a private ownership. Um, it has 55 folios and it, it contains um, pure uh, report of incidents, pure report of in events, no legends, no stories just a list of uh, incidents. Uh, the first incident reported here is um, is in Nepal summit 767, which is uh, 1647. And it reports of um, uh, 
an image of Bhagavati uh, stolen from the palace. And the last event is uh, 1690, from 1690. So these kind of manuscripts are, uh, can be found in hundreds of numbers. Uh, and uh, there are very few of them have been uh, worked. Um, this one is from, um, also from Hudson Collection um, in the British Library in uh, London. Um, this is in Sanskrit, uh, also a Katanavali. But what is interesting is uh, the first um, uh, paragraph here is um, uh, kind of colophon. And um, it says that it was composed for uh, Hudson. Uh, his name is written as Hadasena um, by uh, Amritananda Bandya. And um, interestingly, uh, he says uh, Hudson is a Buddhist. Uh, it says um, Hudson is a, a Tri Ratna Bhakta, a follower of three uh, James. Uh, so this is one example of how um, the, the colonial officials were interested in the Nepalese past. Uh, and this is one of the commission text. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this is a facsimile um, of uh, Hudson's translation of Nepalese Bamshavali into English that I talked to you about. Mm. It has a total of 381 folios uh, divided in three uh, book bound volumes. Um, it is, in, it is uh, archived at volume 16 and 17 in Hudson collection. Uh, and uh, the book is titled Sacred Legends of, uh, Sacred Legends and Bamshabalis of Nepal proper or the, or the Great uh, valley. Um, apart from um, Hasrat's uh, publication, I think very few people have studied it and uh, it deserves uh, uh, it deserves attention, I would say. Okay, the last one I want to show you, this might be interesting for um, for some scholars, uh, this is a Persian translation of Swayambhu Puran. Uh, very few people, few people uh, have um, uh, realized that there is a per Persian translation of Nepalese historiographical text, and it would be interesting if uh, if someone finds out, out more about this uh, in the future. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any time left still from Ms. G? You can still continue us if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me only briefly introduce uh, the book that we published. So, um, um, uh, we have named um, this three volume publication which came out um, in the uh, at, uh, in the end of 2015 uh, we named it Nepalika Bhupa Bamshavali uh, after the name um, uh, name of the manuscript um, uh, in, in uh, which is mentioned at the beginning of the manuscript itself um, the first volume uh, the first and second volume uh, was done by me and Professor Axel Michaels. And the third volume with, with map and historical il illustrations uh, was prepared by uh, Neil Scucho. Uh, the, uh, the first volume has um, an introduction and translation. Uh, an annotated translation of the whole manuscript. 
Uh, the second volume has an annotated edition of the text um, in Nepali, in Devanagari actually. And the third volume uh, has um, several relevant maps uh, uh, of the stories, of the, of the incidents, uh, of the events uh, that are described uh, uh, in the Vamshavali. And also um, uh, it is accompanied by um, several illustrations uh, and drawings that were done uh, during 19th century uh, by different artists, uh, different Nepali artists such as uh, Rajman uh, Chitrakar and by colonial artists such as um, Oldfield, Henry Oldfield, uh, and so on. Uh, and many of these drawings um, uh, were, have been published for the first time. So for the people interested in art history, uh, uh, this, the third volume might be particularly interesting. Um, the, we have used uh, five manuscript to uh, prepare the edition um, of the text. Uh, so the original text that you, we use is uh, Nepalika Vupavam Shavali, uh, which is, uh, as I told, uh, a book, uh, a manuscript uh, archived at uh, Cambridge University, Can Cambridge University Library. Uh, with the uh, manuscript number additional 1952. And uh, this is how it looks. Uh, this is the first page. Uh, it, it is uh, quite a big um, Vamshavali. It has 184 folios uh, with nine lines per page. The language is Nepali. The scribe is not mentioned, uh, but uh, we know that it was uh, compiled in the family of Pandit Amrita Ananda. Um, I think it's the generation after Amrita Ananda uh, uh, when it was compiled. Uh, we have uh, the manuscript has uh, several uh, additional notes um, in the margins um, by uh, second hand. Uh, the latest event described in Bamshabali is offering of the copper roof to Pashupati in 1838. So the Bamshabali doesn't itself have uh, any colophon, so no scribe is mentioned, uh, no date is mentioned of the compilation. But uh, from the last uh, event mentioned, we can assume that it was probably compiled in 1838. Uh, uh, also, we know a, a bit of the history of the manuscript. Uh, we know that the manuscript was um, in possession of uh, Professor Edward uh, Biles Cowell. Uh, he was the first pro professor of Sanskrit at the Cambridge University. And uh, we also know that uh, when Daniel Wright uh, translated this manuscript, this manuscript uh, was borrowed to him by uh, Professor Cowell. And later on, uh, he donated this, um, Cowell donated this manuscript to the Cambridge University Library. So apart from this, uh, we used uh, four other manuscripts for, uh, for comparison for the edition. Um, the edition is not actually a, a critical edition, uh, but uh, it's annotated. Uh, with um, uh, various parallels, uh, whenever uh, uh, we can find uh, the places where the parallel can be created, parallels could be uh, um, uh, could be connected uh, with different manuscripts. So I'll just briefly tell you uh, we use this Buddhist Pamshavali from British Library, uh, Volume Fifty Two, and. Um, two uh, man manuscripts from National Archives, um, A319-2 and A319-5. Uh, they were pretty much in line with the uh, Bamshavali we chose and uh, the main Bamshavali we chose. Um, so it was um, 
it was possible to create a kind of stemata, uh, a, a genealogical relations, uh, relationship of the text uh, between those. Uh, we also chose um, this Paris Pamshavadi, Raja Upakhyana, uh, from the Sylvan Levy collection, even though it is not from uh, the same genre of text, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it was uh, useful for comparative uh, purposes. Mm. And the manuscript itself, um, we divided it into 25 uh, chapters, uh, sorry, 21 chapters. The chapters from one to um, eight belongs to legendary period um, or uh, the period before the, uh, the current yuga and uh, the current uh, Kali Yuga began. Um, and uh, the, um, from chapter nine, to, uh, nine onward uh, is uh, somehow historical period. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manik. Uh, so could you just stop sharing, please? So thank you so much, Dr. Manik. So I would like to open the uh, QA session. So the people who are present here in Zoom, if you have any question yet, let us know. Then yes, we can just take it question. And uh, anybody as uh, the people who are in the Facebook Live, if you have any question, you can just send us on the comment box. Also, Mani, could you take off yeah. like a sharing screen? So we can see. Uh, stop sharing screen. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Please ask for the Mani. Personally. Nobody asking. May I ask one question to Manik? <laughs> so, uh, when we talk about Pasha Bansa, yeah. yeah, these are these all are written only in nineteenth century, and uh, we encounter uh, this Sakka Sambat in this Pasha Bansa in many many ways. Sakka Sambat. Uh, what exactly it is? Many, many people doubt about this uh, Sakka Sambata, what does it mean? And then the, the Sakka Yiga mm -hmm. And then one thing uh, I want to relate to Vajrayagani. Uh, so in this uh, 19th century chronicles, what we see is Vikramaditya uh, is glorified. <laughs> yes, yes. And even this Dipankara uh, Buddha, Buddha is. Uh, head is uh, called Vikramaditya himself. Vikramaditya, yes, yeah. Vikramaditya. Yeah. So, uh, uh, how this come uh, that uh, history is the, uh, uh, this kind of it's illusion? Numbers. illusion. <laughs> yeah, this I mean, is, it's hard to say uh, the source of these kind of stories, you know, because they are. These stories are uh, must have been floating for uh, for a long time, uh, and uh, you see, it's not only in one Bamshabali we find this story you know, of Bikramaditya's head. You know, uh, so this uh, uh, we we exactly don't know how when it began. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the uh, problem with Bamshabali. We can't. Uh, justify everything uh, what the bombshell will say um, we can't plainly justify but nevertheless uh, these stories are still important uh, right. to understand from what is uh, missing in the objective history right yeah. and about this um, soccer era and the become era can you tell something from the uh, the reality uh, is about 
the use of shaka era in nepal you mean shaka era bikram era when did uh, this started in nepal before this pasabansa uh, um, we didn't have real uh, historical evidence about bikram era used in our uh, chronicles or uh, stone uh, inscription uh, that we don't know but i think for shaka era we have um i can't tell i can't remember exactly the name of the king but uh, the there is mention in bamshabali that uh, this king started using shaka era in nepal uh, but if you are interested i can I'm find kaligata kaligata era kaligata kaligata I'm sorry. Kaligata era, era is uh, kind of ritual. Uh, Sokka is, of course, uh, used in, uh, in the past in, in yeah, all yeah. those inscriptions. Yes. Sokka uh, but, starts uh, uh, in 73 of AD, right? Right. Um, um, the Kaligata era, I think, uh, was mostly used for rituals. When... Uh, before beginning of the ritual, uh, the priest has to make a sankalpa, yeah? the, the declaration of the intention of the ritual. And while uh, doing the sankalpa, uh, the priest uh, mostly uses a Kaligata era uh, for that. So I would say Kaligata era was uh, probably mostly used for ritual purposes. We find that in many of the sankalpas, uh, there is a text called Sankalpa Ratnavali. I haven't read it all myself, you know, a garland of sankalpas, you know, different kinds of sankalpas. And if we, uh, if we read that, maybe you, you might get your answer. Uh, uh, is there any dividing line when uh, in Nepal, people began to use this Kaligata Sambhata. In the past, it was not uh, prevalent in those, all those uh, inscriptions found during Lichabi time. Yeah, no, no. As in, in Gopal Bamshavali, we don't, uh, uh, we don't find Kal Kaligata era. Yeah? No, not uh, there. Uh, but I'm not, uh, I can't answer you when it exactly uh, started okay. being used in in the bomb shovel list, right? Okay. Thank you. So, if we have any more question from the participants, uh, it doesn't yeah. have to be any suggestion is also welcome, please. I think Miranda Shaw. Yes, so I just had a question about the last, the answer to the last question, because Sorry. were you saying that some part of Vamshali literature is integrated into Sankalpas? No, or no, no, I didn't mean that. So what, uh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that the Kaligata era is used oh, uh, particularly in, in Sankalpas. Yeah. For, okay. for ritual purposes, for ritual, ritualistic right. purposes. Yeah. All right, because I read one, I'm trying to remember what Sankalpa that integrated the entire history of the site. And maybe it wasn't right. exactly Sankalpa, but it kind of came after that. So I wondered if you yeah. were. Yeah, yes. The Sankalpas are quite important. Uh, the the priest has to relate um, the purpose of the ritual to the spatial, as spatial aspect also. Mm -hmm. So generally, it, it starts with uh, what year, what day is today and where you are located. And then why uh, this ritual is being um, performed today. So all these have to be declared you know, before the ritual actually starts. And it, so it can incorporate some history of that site, like this. Whatever. Right, yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Yes, Miranda, go ahead. Thank you. So I understood, um, Monique, Dr. Vajracharya, that previously you were very interested in ritual processes or ritual texts. Right. So I'm wondering, have you, 
kind of gone over into the Von Schauvely, or is this, I mean, or is this like a side, or is that also that other research ongoing? Uh, no, I'm still interested in uh, ritual studies. Uh, my PhD was on uh, Sapta Vidanuttara ritual. Uh, um, and uh, actually, I still uh, want to come back to this topic. But uh, my current job is uh, about the documents uh, and the yeah, historiographical materials. Mm -hmm. um, Mm, yeah, it's it has been a kind of shift uh, from uh, um, what I was doing in the past. Uh, since two thousand nine, uh, I'm into um, Chavali and uh, and the documents. Okay. So it sounds it sounds like it has engaged you very much, though. Y yes. But you might want to return to virtual. I mean, I was all eagerly awaiting your discoveries. Yeah, I, I should uh, I should publish it. And also, I I have a book in preparation with my uh, professor um, Musashi Tachikawa. Yes. Yeah, and um, um, it should come out soon on the Newa Buddhist iconography. All right. Yeah. I hope you'll let us all know the minute it's published. Yeah, I will. <laughs> of course. Right. Thank you. I'm quite fond of your books, by the way. <laughs> I consulted your books a lot uh, for my studies. Oh, thank you. Great. So I think the Linda has any question? Thank you so much. Namaste. Dr. Bunny. Um, it was really wonderful to hear this presentation and learn about some of the newer publications. I, I feel like I've been in a dark hole for about 10 years now. <laughs> but now that I'm retired, I'm, I'm just so happy to start being able to see some of these things and get back to it. Um, I was struck because uh, just recently I've been looking at a the Salopyakan text and the song for it from Harsidi. Mm. I realized when um, back in 2012, I actually was able to photograph the Salopyakon um, book. Mm. Um, but uh, I realized that the song that they sing about Salopyakon, at least in some of the verses, are like reciting almost at stone inscriptions or it has a vamsavali nature to it. And um, I was wondering if you are also looking at the uh, some of the Kakan texts or text linked to Kakan for this vamsavali style of presentation of history. Um, because I feel like they really would contribute a lot to that. And uh, I'm certainly, I'm very excited about that. And, and Sanku also, I know Gopal, Bala Gopal, um, you have that uh, for the Devi Pyakon, right? And, yes, uh, uh, I could uh, get copy of Devi Pyakon, yeah. Peter Puja, Ganesh Puja. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, uh, you collect the narratives uh, itself or? Uh, no, handwritten text. Okay, but uh, the, the oral transmission is, uh, is it related? Um, is there a relation between the, the text and the, the, or, the oral uh, presentation? Yeah, for instance, uh, Devi Piafong uh, text, uh, they used to train the, the Devi dancers. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, occasionally happens, not uh, every year or twelve years of that, but occasionally happens. And similarly, Peter Puja, uh, mm -hmm. this takes place once in a while when they want. Uh, so during Peter Puja, they use that text uh, where to go, which Peter, the first one, second one, like this, all right. sort of things, and yeah. ingredients they need. These are sure. things. And that's in the Gompiaka too, in Patan and uh, Jalapiaka too, there's some 
connections? Uh, like actually, uh, several years ago, I made an edition of uh, the text from Gong Pia Kong. Oh, did you? Uh, I didn't know. Yes, I was able to photograph the manuscript uh, uh, of, of the, the singing, and but mostly they are uh, ch uh, ch like Charya songs. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have um, I have the transliteration if you are interested uh, on them I could send oh, it to you I would love to see that yes yeah uh, but uh, this Salapiakon this transmission first time I heard <laughs> very interesting uh, I was listening Linda's lecture from two days ago the ne uh -huh. Newade uh -huh. mm. when you mentioned Salapiakon kind of surprise yeah <laughs> this. Uh, I've never, I've actually, I've never seen this Salapiakha itself. So, um, I also believe that uh, part of the Bamshabalis were uh, oral tradition. Be be That's right, yeah. Written mm -hmm. down, yeah. So, uh, I'm sure the this kind of this uh, oral uh, tradition uh, uh, must be still going on uh, in some way. Uh, but, uh, I would try to... Uh, Witness that my that uh, the, the salopiaka one day myself. So. <laughs> I I just have um, a short excerpt from it that they perform during Dasai. I have the video of that, but the 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 full version of it is much more elaborate, and mm -hmm. it refers to Tibetans coming down to see things and. And the language uh, is Newari or? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I have to, I just, um, my photographs from 2012 were locked somehow on my computer. <laughs> and I just the other day after my presentation was able to unlock them and get back to looking at them. And thank goodness they're still available to, to look at. But um, what I'll do, what I'll probably do is try to um, upload those somewhere. Um, if you're interested, you could look yeah. at the text. It's, oh, the, okay. I, I was just, uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I just find that this connection between performing traditions and oral traditions and then the Rum Savalis is a yeah. very important thing to look at. Maybe yeah. Linda, it's fully be possible for you to do the presentation next month. <laughs> uh, Saturday, which will be great. So, to you know, even like a Zalupia, a little bit explain it, span it. Like the last time, you just have a third. We just have a ten minute. So yeah. Just for one hour. So. <laughs> I'll ha I'll have to see if it would work for next month. It might. Yeah. It might yeah. Um, so, when I when I worked on the Outer um, City or Zalupia. I had to look, consult a lot of these Vamsavlis uh, uh, that you mentioned. And uh, uh, that was a very interesting thing to kind of look at, uh, do a concordance of where they all were on the map. And that got published in a, this uh, souvenir edition that in um, Potter Sydney, uh, it's, I don't think it's widely available at all, but I'm wondering if I should put it up somewhere and make a yeah. PDF available, um, you know, uh, Gautam Bhadracharya also published a very nice thing in this volume. Mm -hmm. It's called Dabu. Uh, I don't know. It looks looks like this. Ah, know. okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I maybe what I'll do is, uh, do you pub put things up on the Newar? organization website or do you think academia or Maybe the dance model website or happy to yeah I don't know. Mandal web page too so I'm happy to upload or whatever's needed yeah okay yeah this will be great yeah so it will be great so next month will be the May first so if you want let me yeah and the promise is the in charge promise is the coordinator. So we'll keep in touch with you. Okay. Thank you so much. My Great. Uh, Linda, can I uh, uh, get your email address? Uh, sure. Yeah, um, I'll send you the transliteration of the text from sure. Gopia. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Your sound is not clear. Promise you, your sound is. Nothing is clear. Yeah, promise. Four different. Sorry. Thank you, I got it. Okay, good. Peace. And the last time, uh, Tor was also uh, talking about NASA deal. Also, that will be interesting for coming episodes, I imagine. Uh, oh, I, I'm sure he would love to do that. Uh, very enthusiastic talking, but he was caught up. Uh, Daya didn't want him to long, <laughs> make it long. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was a long, long day. <laughs> yeah, we have a three hours, so it's been goes three hours. Yeah, yeah the program was long, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I was not uh, participating on the same day. We, we watched later on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Also, Mirinda, also, I, I want you to present some things in this platform, too. So, I don't know, whenever, however, you know, so you can do as a Sharia dance or you can do also, uh, you know, I mean, feminine Buddhist goddesses in Nepal. So your book coming out that, so it'll be great to have you here as well, so. Thank you, Prashant. Yeah. We'll that. Okay. So we can make it this happen. That would be great. Okay, any other questions that we have? So, I wondered if money could include me in the transliterations of those songs. I'm just curious about the resemblance. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Song, of course, I yeah. do in for my. Yeah, okay, of course. Um, Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be great, great. Just to see the language. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes, thank you. I can. Put I, my, I can put my okay. email there. Yeah, please. Something. Let me see. Good, good. So, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Manik. So, it is so wonderful to hear your, you know, new research and new book. It is amazing, amazing. I don't know lots of things. Even for me, it's this technological word, it doesn't apply. I have to check on the, the you know, the translation, what that means, like the cosmologies and demolog, what's called typology and demology. Those are for very new for me. Those words. So have to look into so very very impressive and very amazing so this you know it's something that is it is a hidden treasure it is in the uh this uh bangsabali and bangsabali is just like the people just write in you know whatever's happened they just like a notebook just write quickly in back in the old days and that will be the historical moment so this is great great and uh, we're so happy that's you know, it is, it gives some insight. It is a hidden treasure for us to have that information. So it is great, great. And so, yeah, we are so happy to have this platforms with the promise about the heritage. This is the episode number four. So, and hope that so we have an archive. So we try to keep it all in a, you know, line up in a one, one place with this archive. It's a future, you know, people who want to study it's about, uh, he's studied about uh, uh, heritage of Nepal. So this will be the platforms we can provide the more information and, you know, connect it to the, this will be future in some archive will be move forward for the future. So that's what we are trying to do. And I'm so happy and, and also, yeah. 
thank you for promise. This is making this all available. And thank you, Mani, and also the all of you to join this, you know. So we'll continue. Please pass on to the masses to the other, every, everyone. So we try to do first month after uh, Saturday. So if you can pass on and make move on, that will be great, great in future. So, and that's all I have to say. Uh, so if we have any question, we can more discuss or we can also the stop sharing part and uh, I think promise has to restart it, otherwise uh, you're not clear to end it. Can you uh, restart? Maybe it will work. No, he's the one who created this one. It's, he restarted really? Maybe, I don't know. Oh, okay. He's the host. Host. <laughs>